driving to Florida, and I was kind of playing with uh, my shirt and discovered a big lump. And I didn't think much about it at the time because it kind of materialized quickly. I happened to notice a lump in my neck if I turned my head a certain way. They misdiagnosed it as a cyst at first, and then about a month later, my doctor at Abington Hospital uh, kind of threw the C word at me and said this could be cancer, and which terrified me. The cancer had already spread to my lymph nodes in my neck. So the day of surgery, I ended up being in the OR about 16 hours. They actually uh, took the thyroid and then did a neck dissection on the left and the right. I remember sitting in the office and hearing uh, the doctor tell my husband, you know, that he had cancer. And everything happened so quickly, it really was scary because then, you know, you know, you know, this is really serious stuff. He was the healthiest guy around and ate, you know, he ate fruits and vegetables every day, I mean, and worked out, and, and so it just seemed crazy that he would be the one to, to get sick. And then after the surgery, <laughs> to see her, uh, and I've never seen her that sick, you know? Um, so it was, it was rough. This is highly curable. It's just going to be a bump in the road. You're not going to even remember that you had it. The endocrinologist said, you know, this is, this is not going to kill you. This is, you know, of all the things that you could get, this thyroid cancer is, it's a piece of cake. You know, you've, you've got it licked. My numbers, you know, the hormone levels and things, weren't changing the way the endocrinologist expected them to. Well, after the surgery, I found out it was a... Uh, a one in a million type of cancer and incurable. My primary physician wanted me to come um, and get a second opinion. Dr. Marsha Brose is the director of the Thyroid Cancer Therapeutics Program at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also a global leader in the development of the new field of thyroid cancer oncology. Her phase two clinical trial of serafinib in patients with advanced thyroid cancer led to the successful completion of the first ever phase three study in radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer. It's a very small group. And one of the mutations that I had been studying turned out to be very, very prevalent in this group of patients. And at the same time, we were also starting to pull together therapies for these types of tumors. One of the first things they ordered was a CAT scan. And they found over 50, 50 nodules in my lungs that it had spread in that time. Now they were really, really small, but they were there. And that's, that explained why the numbers weren't going in the direction that they expected. So I did successive surgeries. And they continued to find lumps in my throat. And I um, had to go through surgery, but it was still there in the tissues. And it was looking, you know, very dire, very grim. There was somebody who needed something and had you know, a lot of, a lot of um, nodules and wasn't looking at a good outcome. And he wanted to try anything as you can imagine they would. Experimental drugs do not have a, a great um, reputation, but five and a half years ago she put me on a drug called Serapin and it did uh, stop the growth of my cancer. And the first scan at two months actually showed 30% decrease. And I, my, the endocrinologist I was working at was speechless. She couldn't believe it. And then a new mutant form kind of came up about three and a half years ago and they had another drug for it, Everlimus and that stopped it for quite a while. My cancer was too small for me. Any of the nodules were too small for me to start the study. It sounds sort of nerve wracking, right? You know, we're gonna wait for you to progress before we actually treat you. But actually that was to protect the patients. So um, every six months I had CAT scans, waiting for the cancer to get big enough so that I could start trial. If the therapy has a toxicity, and the, the risk and the toxicity outweighs the benefit. As a physician, you don't want to give it. Because you're torn between wanting to take care of this and not really wanting it to grow. So um, the waiting was kind of difficult at times. So many of these patients sometimes can have an indolent phase. It can be, for some people, it can be, you know, one month, some people it's six months. I have a couple of patients who I haven't started treating yet, and it's been five, five years. Now, can you imagine if I treated everybody the same, 
all those people would have had therapy, well, the people who didn't need it would have had it for five years. We finally got the word that it was big enough. My desire of being a physician is to obviously help people, but I also feel that my talent is in, is in research. And so I couldn't imagine just going to clinic and just doing what was always told to me to do. I always wanted to be making it better. It was sort of a compulsion or, you know, occupational hazard, as you you know, if you will. But whatever it was, I that was going to be my bent. So it's been nine years total, uh, which is much longer than I should have had, considering the type of cancer I had.